All right, now let's configure the scene together and look at the camera settings. The first line is for the automation process. You can check the interaction automation here. When you're doing this, the distance between virgin plane and camera gets divided by 30 or whichever value you, you put in here. So you can also choose a lower value and your cameras will go further apart, but the standard is about 30. So the strength of that is as soon as you move your convergence plane, the distance between your cameras gets adjusted automatically. You can see right here the cameras go further apart when I move the screen away, and they're going closer together when I move the screen closer to the camera. Um, when you're working with pixel parallax, you will use this for, for a quick setup, but then you just look which value I've got here. Oh, it's about 4. Put this value in here and uncheck the automation. So now you're controlling your, your interaction only with this value. What you can see is that the near and far plane are getting squeezed together as soon as you, you choose a higher value for the distance between your cameras. Good. Now let's choose where our convergence plane, our zero plane, should be. Um, let's just pick something like this. A lot of cubes are coming out of the screen. And now we will use 70% of our maximum pixel parallax, which means we've got 45 pixels to use. Uh, we are, at the moment we are at the total of 50 pixels, so let's just remove 5 pixels from our near plane parallax. And let's just keep the far plane parallax around 20 pixels. And as you can see, the planes are already touching our objects, so we should use a smaller interaction to get more stereoscopic space. So just a little bit more. So now our far plane can go... Yes, our far plane is really close there and we already... We also have a bit of space down here, so maybe... Hmm, maybe we can put this on, on 3.8 and just give this one a little bit more. So maybe you can push this even further. Yes. All right. We are on 45 pixels. Okay. 4.0. Maybe this can work. We just got a, a little bit down here and here. Yes, uh, an interaction of 4 can work, but we are really close in here but it isn't so so bad because we have a depth score of 70 percent so if it goes a little bit above this doesn't matter and this is how you should set up your scene you um, get your parallax settings right and then you fine adjust how close can i get the near and the far plane to my scene all right the pixel parallax and the near and far plane should be clear right now you can uh, hide the planes right here hide the near plane or hide the far plane and I've also added this plane's fill button so you can make better decisions if, if anything is crossing your far plane or your near plane. Below here is just a small calculator that adds these two values together that's just for lazy people like me. Alright, let's talk about the floating frames. When something hits the side of the frame, like this cube right here, I'm just going to disable the plane's fill mode so we can see more clearly. When something hits the side of the screen like this cube here and gets out of the screen at the same time a paradoxon occurs. The cube seems to float in front of the screen but he also gets occluded by the edge of the screen. Therefore the cube can't be in front of the screen. Just show you in here the cube gets out of the screen, these two, but they are also, this one also gets occluded by the screen. And the solution for this is to project the stereoscopic window in front of the screen too. To do this, you just have to enable the floating frame and move it most commonly uh, to your near plane. So we have got 68 by 68. And what happens now is that this cube gets hidden in the, in the left view and not in the right view. So it seems as if the screen borders are floating around the viewer space. You can also lean the floating frame if 
you only want to uh, occlude this cube or if only a floor is is getting out of the screen. You can even animate this floating frame. For example, the cube stays behind the screen, but then at frame 14, the cube is at this position. So in, in frame 0, the cube is behind the screen. We set a floating frame to 100. And on frame 14, where the cube is getting out, we will just use 68 by 68 keyframe that and the floating frame moves along with the cube out of the screen. Leaning and animating the floating frame won't be noticed very much by your audience. But the floating frames only work with black surrounding. So it works well in cinemas and on monitors with black borders running in full screen mode. But if you want to check your floating window, you should put a thick black border around your image afterwards. And you should also render out the floating frames as a separate pass, so you can correct errors afterwards. Make sure the floating frames aren't visible when rendering, especially when you have more than one rig in your scene. Because another camera could see the frame and then you will have a black bar in your rendering. Alright, down here you can also convert to a parallel setup and the floating frame stays at the right place. But when you convert this to a toad-in setup, the floating frame isn't that exact anymore. So if you need this function, just call me about it. I think it's all right with this little arrow here. It's just about one pixel. That's too much. It may work for you. And when you're working on a toad in setup, you always have to check both of these boxes. Because when you uncheck this, you will have pretty strange results. All right, below are some formulas by Louis Marcou that are useful when you are rendering parallel. You just put your desired image width in here. And the calculator tells you how much wider your screen has to be. If you want to have exactly what you see in the main camera, you will also have to adjust the field of view and put this value in here. But I would recommend the off-axis setup as it does all the cropping for you and keeps you away from all this trouble and calculating and, and everything. Great, now let's go to the anaglyph preview. For the anaglyph preview, you will have to look through this camera and this camera, uh, I'll just reveal it for you, is actually a camera pointing backwards looking at this small plane. And you should always make sure to disable the anaglyph preview plane when you are rendering with multiple cameras. The preview is also stretched very often. I'm sorry I don't have a solution for that and it seems that everybody else has the same problems when using the camera shader. So um, anaglyph preview can only be a preview because it, it stretches your image. But still, down here you have six different shaders in two categories. The Blackstar shaders and the MoGraf shaders. The Blackstar shaders require the Blackstar shader plugin. The strength of these shaders are that they are a bit more stable than the MoGraf shader. And these shaders are also available down to Cinema 4D Release 10 or even lower, while the MoGraf shader only is available in Cinema 4D Release 11.5. The backdrop is, you need to download the free plugin, but the link is below, so it shouldn't be that hard. I would recommend the Blackstar shader, but if you have release 11.5 or higher, you won't need them. Alright then, every shader group has three anaglyph methods. Black and white, anaglyph and optimized anaglyph. So, just demonstrate them to you. This is the black and white anaglyph. Very good to look at the, the edges and the parallax. Then the standard anaglyph, you can see you have full color, but these orange letters will give you pretty much eye strain with your red and cyan glasses. That's why I've also included an optimized anaglyph shader, which turns everything that is reddish into a gray or a black hue, so you won't get that much eye strain. And as you can see, the, the black star shader doesn't stretch our scene that much in height as the, as the MoGraph shader. While the MoGraph shader keeps our floating frames and only squeezes everything vertically. So you have to, to look which of these two shader groups work best with your setup. It depends on your aspect ratio. It depends on which aspect ratio this window, window has. And well, it, it isn't easy. <laughs> so just look which shader works best for you and hope this helps. All right, now I want to show you the SV Viewfinder.
And this is just a little tool for image composition. So on the SV Stereo Rig, you go to SV Viewfinder. And first, you have to select Viewfinder off. And you can see the rule of thirds is applied to your viewport. And now you can, can decide, all right, for, for a character that stands here, he gets two-thirds of the screen space, and his opponent standing down here gets one-third and isn't that important. Or you can also use the these focal points for image composition. There's also the golden ratio if you want to work with this. And a lot of other other useful things like the primary and secondary golden ratio and you can also flip this whole setup so this is your main focal point. And I've also put in some useful diagonals for more dynamic shots. But I will talk about the SV viewfinder in a separate screen capture where I can talk more about picture composition and I will also publish this small tool as a free setup so, so everybody can use it. You will also find the link below. Then let's look at the workflow after the camera is set up. The best thing to, to render in stereo is with the render queue, which you can find right here or on window and render queue. And what you can do is you just use file and set at current scene and now. So now we have our actual scene and camera, you select the left camera, then you can say add current scene again and we still don't want to save. Select your right camera and now you have your left camera and your right camera. You have to check these two first, go to jobs, start rendering and cinema will process all the files. And if you don't work in release 12, you can choose this way, just go into your render settings, name your scene, for example, SV Stereo Rig um, version 80, and then I uh, usually put a big L at the end of it, say SV Stereo Cam, render it, and this is a nice feature of cinema. While I'm rendering, I can change the render settings and adjust the scene in here. So while my first sequence is rendering, I just go in here, put an R behind it, select the right cam, and then when the, the image is done, I render again. And for post-production, I would recommend you to watch my tutorials. And I can also recommend the Stereo 3D Scripts for After Effects by Christoph Keller, which is a, a really great suit for stereoscopic imagery in After Effects and has a lot of functions I've dreamed of. So you can also find the link below the video and enjoy. Okay, let's talk about the pricing. What you will get? My stereoscopic rig, of course, with all the features I've shown you. And the stereoscopic rig also works in Cinema 4D release 10 to release 12. You will get free updates and you can also make suggestions what should be added or what needs to be improved. And you will also get a little bit of support. If something is limiting you, I can erase some expressor notes or do some personal improvement. I will also answer some questions and help you, just as I'm doing all the time when someone writes an email to me. But I would prefer a comment so others can, can see the solution I've posted too. Now, finally, to the pricing. <laughs> I think stereoscopy is so niche that I can set up a personal pricing. So big studios and companies will have to pay 100 euro. Small studios and companies will have to pay only 80 euros. So you can pay 100 euro immediately or just contact me and we will talk about the pricing. Students will also get 50% off, and if the project is really good, they may even get it for free. But if you want my rig for, for free, I want to see something afterwards. You won't get the rig just to play around and do some test renderings you can put up on YouTube. If you want to do that, you can use the free version of my rig. But if you want to work professionally, you will have to use my Stereo Rig Pro. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope to hear from you soon. Bye bye!